always teaching expectations. Uh, and we all have expectations in life. Some expectations bring a breath of fresh air. Some expectations boost our spirits. Expectations can give us a different perspective on our current situation, depending on the expectation that we have. Now, I want to encourage you that we should have expectations daily, especially every morning when we open God's Word, we should pray for the Lord to show us something new. We should have great expectation that God will speak to us through His Word. To search our hearts so that we can remove the things that are not profitable uh, or, or put in the things that are needed in our lives. And that expectation for God to show us His will and His direction. Psalm 139, one of my favorite passages in Scripture, the last two verses, verses 23 and 24. David writes, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. Now, we all have expectations, but do we have the right and proper expectations? Now, you have been there. You thought something was going to turn out a certain way, and then it went the exact opposite. Your expectation was a complete disappointment. I can remember when Missy and I lived in Florida, and one time we were getting ready to move. We felt called to go back to Missouri. We thought that the Lord was leading us, and every door was sh uh, shut. We did not end up going there, and we ended up going another 1,800 miles west to Idaho. We were not expecting to go to Idaho. And, and kind of for our, our walk today, for us personally, uh, I would have never thought in a million years that we would be uh, in Plymouth, England, pastoring a church. But uh, our expectation has uh, kind of changed in life. We've always just decided to think about, okay, what may God want to do and we want to expect that God will work and not ex necessarily expect a certain outcome that we think it should be. Now, I don't know about you, but Missy and I have found the very, a very hard lesson in life that every time we think we figure out what God wants to do, he does the exact opposite. So we know that when we figured something out, that's probably not the Lord. And then we just want to glory in what may happen because when we figured it out, that's not what usually happens. Now, for Israel, here at the time of Jesus, they had an expectation of their Messiah. They thought that he would come in and remove their oppression. He thought they would come, he would come in and transform the government and be their ruler. They thought that he would lift them up and put everyone else beneath them. Now, it's an interesting thing about this expectation because, frankly, these expectations are true. Jesus will come back and remove oppression. Jesus will transform the government and rule. And Jesus will lift us up to be seated with him in heavenly places. But they misunderstood the scriptures. Their timing was off. And sometimes we do the same thing. Here, what we will find out is that Jesus came to this earth to remove oppression from hearts. Jesus came to transform people. And Jesus came to pay the price for our sins so that we could have a relationship with God. So from chapter 2 last week to chapter 3 this week, uh, some 25 years plus has passed. And we are on the scene now, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. And it says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first thing that John tells us that we need to do is repent. So what is repentance? Uh, I, got, I, I, re I feel really bad, so I apologize. That is repentance? No, that's not repentance. Well, I got caught, so I'm really sorry. No, that is not repentance. These can be the effects of recognizing the sin in our lives, and these things may be good motivators, but they are not repentance. Repentance is a change in direction. We are heading one way and we stop, do a 180 degree turn and start moving the other direction. I think one of the biggest challenges for believers 
his movement. We can see sin in our lives, acknowledge God, receive his forgiveness, and stop doing those awful things that we used to do. Then we stand still, or in fact, sometimes we may sit down. But repentance is turning and moving in the other direction. And we do this by a couple of things. We spend time in God's word. We spend time in prayer. We spend time in fellowship with believers at church. And we spend time serving. Now, John here is preaching repentance, and it's not a one-off. Jesus did the same thing. Turn over one page, probably, in your Bible to Matthew chapter 4, and let's look at verse 17. And it says, From the time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we're, we get an interesting uh, view here. It all starts with repentance. Now, in Luke chapter 13, I want to tell you a story about it. You don't have to turn there. But Luke 13, Jesus was asked to comment about uh, this thing that happened. Pilate kill, was killing some Galileans and how bad Pilate was, how bad the Romans were, and the people that all participated in this crime were. And they asked Jesus about it. And Jesus says in Luke 13, 3, he says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. It doesn't matter who you are or where you've come from. It doesn't matter your status in society or the color of your skin. We all must repent. Peter preaching at the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 3 verse 19, he says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Later on in chapter 8, verse 22, it says, Repent, therefore, of your wickedness, and pray to God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven. Listen, it all starts with repentance. And so he also says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, what does this mean? Well, let's take the easy part first, the at hand part. At hand meaning it's available to you, it's ready for you to observe, touch, or even take possession of. So the kingdom of heaven is ready for us. It is ready for you to be a part of. But what exactly is the kingdom of heaven? Now, we're not going to answer that question today because remember when last week when we broke out the sections of Matthew, chapters 4 through 7, Jesus is proclaiming the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. In chapters 8 through 10, he will be bringing the kingdom of God to our lives. It'll be applicable. How do we do this? So to answer that question here in a couple of minutes, we're not going to be able to. So if you want to read forward, go ahead. But as we teach through this book, we're going to find out what the kingdom of heaven is all about. But Matthew is telling us something. John is proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven is here. It is at hand. It is ready. So let's hang on to that thought. And we'll continue on through, um, starting in verse 3. So for this, he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, say, saying, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and food. his food was locust and wild honey. Now, this is a wonderful fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. And if you'll do me a favor, turn there real quick. Turn backwards, Isaiah chapter 40. And I want you to read verse 3, but we're going to read a couple more verses. Verse 3 says, right, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And verse 4 says something. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Matthew sharing this story for us because Jesus is getting ready to come on the scene. How awesome is this? Again, another fulfilled prophecy. Now, John is the cousin of Jesus. He's about six months older than Jesus is. And all of that detail is in Luke chapter 3. If you want to read that uh, on your own, it's a good study. We find out uh, where John came from, who his, or who his parents were. 
Now, and some would say this guy is crazy. He's living out in the woods, eating honey and bugs, and he would have been quite a sight to see. So you kids out there, next time Halloween comes up, you want a good costume, camel's hair and a belt, you can dress up like John the Baptist. But now imagine this description alone and having this guy want to interview for your company or in fact come and be a part of church. We might hesitate a little bit, right? Verse 5. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the regions around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So there's this guy who eats bugs and honey with camel skin clothes, and people are talking about him, and they want to see what's going on. They come out and see what's happening. And what is happening? John is preaching repentance, preaching the kingdom that the kingdom of God is near, and the people respond. They confess their sins, and they were baptized. Now, John is known in Scripture as John the Baptist. No, that wasn't the denomination he was involved in. He was a dunker. He, you know that if you went to see him, he was going to address your sin and then say, hey, you need to be baptized. Underwater, back up. Baptism, by definition, means to dip repeatedly, to immerse or submerge, to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to wash or to make clean with water, to wash oneself or to bathe, or to overwhelm. But the Greek word here, baptismo, means to identify with. So if you're being baptized, you're identifying with something. And this is a symbol that identifies us with Christ. You get baptized, you're put underwater, and you come back up. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. So right in the margin there of your Bible, if you want a good reference, write Romans chapter 6, verse 4. I'm going to read it to you. Paul teaching. He says, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he even gave us some instruction about baptism. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptism is an act of obedience in our walk with Christ. The act of baptism alone does not save you. Just being a part of it does not make you saved. Baptism is an act of obedience, and it will show the world that you are serious about your relationship with Jesus. Listen, no matter where you are, I don't care what part of the world you are, when people gather together and they go out in the water and you see people dunking people, Everybody knows what that means, and it is an amazing thing to be a part of. But also, baptism, just another example, Philip and the Ethiopian in uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 36 and 37, uh, Luke writes, And they went down from the road, and they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now listen, if you've never been baptized, would you please call us? Let's set up a time, and I'm sure that the Calvary Plymouth family would love to come and celebrate that with you and be a part. If you have any questions about baptism in more detail, we have a small one-page Bible study that we could send to you. Call us and we'll get it to you. And when you get done with it, if, you, if there's something you want to discuss, please call me. Uh, we'll get together and answer any questions you might have. So, an amazing thing is happening uh, that is going on here is that people are repenting and getting baptized. Now, this is not something new. This, this repentance thing, we have to understand, this is not something that just came along when Jesus showed up. In Leviticus chapter 5, verse 5, it says, and it shall be that if he is guilty of any of these matters, that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. That's repentance, confession. Daniel, when he was praying in chapter 9, verse 20, he said, Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, I presented my supplication before the Lord my God by, for the, to the holy mountain of God. 
Nehemiah did the same thing in chapter 1, verse 6. If you remember a few months back, like a long, quite a few months back, he's praying not only for himself, but Israel, that they are in exile and Jerusalem is in a mess. In verse 6, he says, Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open. You may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Confessing our sins in this is this. We are putting our actions before the Lord and getting his opinion on the matter. Then acknowledging his view, the sin in our lives must be addressed. And when we confess our sins to God, you know what he does? He forgives us. How awesome is that? So back to Matthew, let's start in verse 7. Now John is going to teach the people and us something very valuable. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not think in, to say to yourselves, Well, we have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. For even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. There are a few things here that we must look at very carefully. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, so Pharisees and Sadducees, these are the religious leaders of the time. So let's just get a quick definition of what these guys actually are. The Pharisee was a sect that seemed to have started after the Jewish exile. Uh, we do not read of the Pharisees or Sadducees really anywhere in the Old Testament. According to Josephus, at the time of Christ, the Pharisees numbered more than 6,000. Uh, theologian Matthew Poole pointed out four things about the Pharisees that should, should stand out, and we'll see that uh, as we continue through the book of Matthew. Number one, they believed that one was made righteous by keeping the law, and they believed themselves to be righteous in this way. They often misinterpreted the law. They held many traditions to be equal to the authority of Scripture. They were often hypocrites in their practice, neglecting the core of the spirit of the law, but emphasizing the aspects of the outward observance. So just that description alone, what do you think the expectations of the Pharisees was when Jesus came on the scene or for their Messiah? The Sadducee. This is a religious party of the time among Jesus, uh, of, of Jesus among the Jews. They denied any oral law that was revelation of God to the Israelites. They deemed the written law only to be observed uh, by the nation, and it was the divine authority. But they denied a few things. They denied the doctrine of the resurrection. They denied the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. Uh, they denied the existence of spirits and angels, and they, de they denied divine predestination or the affirmed free will of man. Now, John will address them. Now, just, we're going to see this. We read it already, but uh, if you want to win friends and influence people, I would probably encourage you this is not the approach that you would want to take. But John here is calling them out. So we're going to trust that this is spirit-led, and uh, let's see what he says. Verse 7. Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruit worth of, worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. John knew exactly why they were there. They wanted to put on a show that they were searching or looking for the Messiah. But were they sincere? No. Well, because they didn't come to repent or be baptized. They knew about the wrath to come. They thought that it was only the Gentiles and not them that were going to experience this wrath. God's wrath will be just and true, and it will come on all who have rejected Jesus, the Son of God. They pretended to want to escape from this wrath to come, but yet they, did, they lacked true repentance. And they felt that they didn't need to because they were Jewish. 
But John challenges them to bear fruits worthy of repentance, meaning that if you have repented or you want to repent, your life should be different. There should be a change. Both the Pharisees and Sadducees thought that because they were Jewish, because he said, you think because we have our father Abraham, they thought they were covered. They, it didn't matter if they repented or not. To them, it only mattered what they did, their works. But John is very sarcastic, telling them that God can make kids out of stones, <laughs> Abraham's kids out of stones, and that their words, works didn't mean anything without repentance. It is very easy for us to create expectations that we can comply with. We come up with a list, we follow the list, and then we compare everyone to our list, concluding that we are spiritual because of our list, and that people that don't comply with our list, well, they're not spiritual. This is what the Bible interprets and Paul teaches about it in Colossians is legalism. Legalism. Verse 10. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Again, John calls out that if there is true repentance, sin will need to be removed. Sometimes things in our lives need to be removed. Now, have you ever chopped down a tree? Removed a bush or a tree? The root ball as well? I mean, it's hard work. It's violent work swinging an axe and chopping at a tree. But if you want it gone, it's going to take a lot of vigorous, hard work to get it out and remove it. Because we don't want it growing back again. John is telling us here that the reason these trees need to be removed is well, because they don't bear fruit. Now, if you have anything in your life that doesn't bear fruit, that doesn't produce anything of value, do you have anything of value in the kingdom of God? Now, there may be things in your life that you need to cut down and they need to be thrown in the fire. They are not producing anything of value in your life and they are not, they are not producing anything godly in your life. And that is what John is telling these religious leaders. All of their rules and traditions are not bringing them into a relationship with God. They are actually hindering it, and action needs to happen. These religious works that they have need to be removed. Now, I do not think that the Pharisees or Sadducees were expecting this kind of welcome from John. And John tells them about the Messiah. Jesus will not meet their expectations. We will see in later chapters that they are constantly testing and challenging the teachings of Jesus, but he would radically change their lives if they would start with repentance. Verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. Those sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquestionable, unquenchable fire. Now, you can repent and be baptized, and you will probably be back and do it again. This is what John's telling him. But there's a guy that's coming that I'm not worthy of. This guy, if he needed someone to carry his shoes, I'm not sure that I would even be worthy to carry his shoes. And he says, this guy that's coming, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You know, it's, it's hard to comprehend sometimes to really understand how radical this would have sounded to these people, especially the Pharisees and Sadducees. I mean, what does this mean to be immersed in the Holy Spirit and in fire? Well, the promise of the Holy Spirit is actually... From Ezekiel, Ezekiel 37, 14, if you want to write that down in the margin of your Bible. Ezekiel writes, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Baptized with fire is referring to judgment and purification. The fires of judgment, which will purify the pure and destroy the wicked like chaff. John tells them that their ritual purifications are nothing like God's cleansing of the heart. He says his winnowing fan, 
is his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out the threshing floor and gather wheat into his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The Messiah will clean up the unnecessary things of our lives, throwing all the wheat into the air as the valued grain falls to the ground and then the chaff and waste is blown away. But the Messiah is going to gather the wheat and burn up the chaff. Now, this was not the expectation of the Pharisees or the Sadducees. They thought that when the Messiah returned, that he would come to them, and he should, right? I mean, come on. These were the disciplined religious leaders of the day. Why in the world would the Messiah come for a lowly people that didn't try? They didn't have an education. They weren't disciplined in washings or following the law or praying wonderful prayers for everyone to hear. They expected the Messiah to be looking for the elite to establish the kingdom. Now, Luke gives us a little more insight into what happens after John addresses the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Turn over a couple pages to Luke chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 10. Luke chapter 3. In Luke's uh, description of this story that happens, this is right after John has addressed the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And look at verse 10. So the people asked, saying, What shall we do then? And he answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to one who has none. And he who has no food, who has food, let him do likewise. Then the tax collectors came to be baptized, and he said to them, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, What shall we do? And he said to them, do not, in, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. Now the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not. Now isn't this an amazing thing about another perspective of what has happened at this time? People are coming and they're asking questions like, well, what do I do? And John's just giving them simple answers of how to be right with the Lord. Just look, okay, listen, here's the things that you used to do. Don't do those things anymore. Those are wrong. Start doing these things. And people are hearing him and they're thinking, is he the Messiah? Well, John will answer that question for us. Turn back to Matthew chapter 3. We'll be in verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John the Baptist and at the Jordan to be baptized. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, but you are coming to me. Now Jesus walked about six miles from Galilee, and he came to his cousin to be baptized. Sorry, I'm going to have you turn again. Turn back over to Luke chapter 1. God had a call on John's life. The angel of the Lord talking specifically to Zacharias, John's dad, before he's born, Luke chapter 1, verse 15, he says this, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he shall turn away the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Turn many to the, of the children of Israel to the Lord uh, their God. He will also give before, go before him, in the spirit and in the power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers of children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Back to Matthew. So listen, it's understandable to see why people might think that John is the Messiah. But John makes it clear that he is not. Remember, he is literally the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Verse 15. But Jesus answered him and said, Permit it now, or permit it to be so now, for thus is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, John, allowed Jesus, he baptized him. And when he had bapti been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and had lighted upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is always inclusive, isn't he? Never exclusive. 
He says, listen, it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. He's saying, John, listen, bro, me and you, we got to do this thing together. And how awesome would it have been to see this? The Holy Spirit descending on the Son, Jesus. The Father speaking to the Son. The three of them together, all at this one moment. Jesus allow, showing the love and compassion to his cousin John. They both knew that this day was going to come. Some 30 years they had been waiting and wondering when this would happen. And now John baptizes Jesus. He comes out of the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. Alighted is the word in the King James and in the uh, New King James. I like what the ESV says. It says it rested upon him. And that word means to rest upon, to come forth, or to show itself. And then he says, And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in who I am well pleased. Listen, listen, we have to remember something. Jesus never did anything unless it was instructed by the Father. Jesus tells us in John chapter 6, verse 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. God loves his son Jesus, and God loves his creation. God wanted relationship with his creation because of our sin, and because of our sin, but because of our sin, we were separated. Then God sent Jesus. Jesus paid for our sins. He covered the payment to a righteous God because there's no way that we could have done it. John 14, verse 6, a verse to memorize, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. The expectation of man, the Jewish nation, the Pharisees and the Sadducees of Jesus, of who Jesus is, was not met in their eyes. But I am so thankful that God never meets my expectations in the way that I think they should be met. He always does more above and beyond. Ephesians 3.20 says, And now to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think.